Hey everybody, it's Kurt here with the IDMI and I'm super excited right now to announce to you the establishment of a new channel and to kick off this channel. We're gonna start with a video on the timing of the rapture, what the Bible says about the timing of the rapture. And so we invite you to sign up to get our newsletters and get our regular updates so that you can be informed about what's going on in the process of the transition uh, from the church age into the kingdom age, which is going on right now. So I'm just honored to be able to be here and share uh, what the Lord has kind of laid on my heart tonight. Hopefully this is a blessing um, uh, to you. And uh, really we're here to talk about the rapture, right? And the timing of the rapture. And we all know that the rapture is a thing. It's in the Bible. It's going to happen. We know that the Bible talks about the rapture. We just are confused about the timing of it. And I think we're going to see tonight that God's not confused about it and the Bible's not confused about it, but the church is confused about it. And we're going to even talk about what does that mean? What is the church? So what does the Bible actually say about the timing of the rapture? And we're just going to look. We're just going to dive in. We're going to look at what people are saying and then check it and go, okay, is, is that really what that says? Let's go look, you know? And um, because I don't want any of you or anybody who watches this video uh, anywhere in the world to think that, um, or, you know, to have wrong understanding of this. So, of course, you know, my name's Kurt Olson, founder and president of the IDMI, which Dave already said is the International Disciple Making Initiative. This is something that Carrie and I started back in about 2015. And... Um, since, uh, well, and our mission, when we launched it, our mission is to finish the Great Commission by launching disciple-making movements in every nation and among every people group on earth, specifically focusing on the most unreached people in the world. And even right now, we've got opportunities to go to some of the places in the world where people have never heard the name of Jesus. They don't even know he's an option to follow because they, you know, they've never, they've never heard his name. And we've got opportunities to train hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, missionary church planters to go into those areas and literally get the Great Commission uh, finished. Since 2015, we have literally seen, and, and it, it, it sounds crazy, but hundreds of thousands of people come into the kingdom of God. Tens of thousands of churches started around the world. The Lord has done miraculously more than we could ever imagine, you know, just by simply training disciples who know how to actually obey Jesus and then make more disciples. One, one friend of ours said, it's just really making disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And I'm like, yeah, that, that's a simple way to put it. So, but what, you know, we go into all of what is a disciple and all of that, which we're not going to touch on tonight, but God has really, um, you know, done more than we ever imagined that he uh, would or even could through our, our little lives. Um, I, I, I came to Christ in 1987. I surrendered my life to the Lord at a very low time in my life. And since that time, I've been reading the Bible almost every single day. So for about 35 years now, I've been reading the Bible, and I've been learning things, and I've been reading books, and I've been, you know, just studying the Word. And now I find myself working as an as a, a international Bible teacher, and I mostly teach pastors and bishops and elders and missionaries and church planters, which was never anything that I thought that uh, God would do. Uh, with my life. So one of, the, one of the things that we have to get out of the way as we, as we start tonight is who is your teacher? Who do you learn from? Who's your primary teacher? Who's your best teacher? Because what I find is that uh, sometimes people get stuck in a rut and they only know how to learn from other people. They only know how to learn from, you know, uh, their favorite pastor or their favorite author or their favorite, you know, YouTube presence. But we have other we have other options and so i want to show you what those options are just just quickly so that when you leave here you don't feel like you have to uh, only believe what somebody who has a phd behind their name says because there are actually people who are willing to teach you who are higher authorities than those people and so that's what we're going to look at. So in John 6, verse 45, Jesus said, 
It's written in the scriptures, they will all be taught by God. The they there is the people who are being drawn to Jesus by the Father. He says, all of those people will be taught by God, and everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Now let me ask you a question. Who is the teacher in this passage? I'm sorry, who? God? God? Yep, God. Which God? God the, thank you. God the Father, right? So the teacher in this verse is God the Father. Do you think the Father will ever mislead you? Never? No? Right? He won't take you down a wrong path. He won't teach you something wrong. Now, here's another teacher. Matthew 23, Jesus said, Don't let anyone call you teacher, for you have only one teacher. And who's that? Right? The Messiah. Jesus Christ. Absolutely. So Jesus, the Messiah, is another teacher who is available to you. And then, do you, anybody sensing a trend here? Who do you think this third one is? There you go, right? Jesus said, you're going to get the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is going to, um, he's going to come to you, and he will guide you into all truth. And he will not speak on his own. He will tell you what he's heard. So pay attention to that line. He doesn't speak just whatever he wants. The Holy Spirit doesn't make stuff up and teach it to us. He teaches only what he hears, right? Now, there's another passage, and this, this one is rarely talked about. I've never heard anyone preach on it uh, other than me. Um, but 1 John 2.27, Joni, I, 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 did I hear you chuckling? Yeah. Um, no, but you've been around when we've talked about this. John says, you've received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you. Look at this right here. So you don't need anyone to teach you. Huh. So the only teacher you really need is who? Holy the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yeah. Wow. So like I said, sometimes we get stuck in a rut. It's not, long, it's not wrong to learn from human teachers. Some people tell me that I have a teaching gift and so they learn things from me. But I'm really successful if I teach them how to learn from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit instead of me. Right? So they're not dependent on me. They're dependent on God for their learning. So the Holy Spirit's the only teacher we need. And the least important of all, Jesus did give gifts to the church, and the gifts he gave to the church are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So if Jesus gives the church a gift of teachers, then that's a gift for the church. It's a gift the church can use, right? And it's not... Um, it's, so I'm not trying to downplay that. I'm just trying to help you see that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are also available to teach you. Now, really, who's the source? The source of all truth is God the Father. Right? Think about that. God the Father will teach you directly. So you can, you're reading the scripture and you can say, Father, I don't get this. Help me understand this. And he will. Sometimes it's a day or a week later. Sometimes it's a, you know, months later. Have you had, you've experienced that, brother? Yeah, me too. So, you know, you, sometimes I've had it where the Holy Spirit reminds me, like, do you remember years ago when you asked me this? Well, here's the answer, you know. And uh, so um, Jesus will teach you, but Jesus even said that he only teaches what he hears from the Father. He said, I don't make stuff up either. I don't just willy-nilly say whatever I want. I only tell you what I hear from the Father. And the Holy Spirit only teaches what he hears. And the human teachers, I don't know if you know this verse, in 1 Peter 4.11 Peter said, if any of you speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. So those of us who are human teachers, who, who have that gift or that calling or, or that you know, job even, we are only supposed to speak if we're speaking the words of God. We're not supposed to make up our own stuff. So as I was preparing for this, for this uh, teaching tonight, I was inviting people on uh, Facebook. How many of you had me reach out to you on Facebook or texting or something, right? Yep, probably many of you. And uh, one friend wasn't able to be here tonight, but the friend uh, in, in our correspondence, they said, well, what do you think about that topic? And what went through my head, this is not what I responded, but what went through my head was, who cares what I think? What matters is what God thinks, right? That's really what matters. We learned that from a pastor friend years ago. A guy, he used to say that all the time. But that's what immediately went through my head. So before we move into this, we have to define some terms. Make sure we're all on the same page when it comes to some of the words we're going to be using tonight as we discuss this topic. And by the way, 
I just want to give a public thanks to my wife. Uh, thanks for, no, seriously, thanks for putting up with me. Thanks for being, um, you know, married to me. But thanks for helping me. I, I started going through this presentation. Everybody give Terry a hand. Um, I imagine that I can't always be easy. Uh, but <laughs> has she been talking to you? <laughs> um, no, Carrie, I, I started going through my slides and Carrie was just like, oh, oh, yeah, no, 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 you can't say that. Oh, no, 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 you can't put, you can't put that slide there. Oh, no, 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 you need to, and, and literally I spent the whole day yesterday just rearranging everything according to the wisdom that God gave my wife. Because I think I was putting it together like I was doing a pastor's conference or something. And it's like, no, you're just, you're regular people. And so I need to just, um, I need to change my approach. So thank you, honey. Um, so let's define some terms. Now, the first thing we're here to talk about what? The rapture. The rapture yep. Um, can, what, what do you think of when you think of the rapture? What do you, how do you define that? Just, you know, like, what, what is that? If somebody says, what's the rapture? It's the what? Catching away, okay. Catching away of? Huh? The second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ. The catching away of, I heard somebody say? The church. The church. Okay. Anybody else have anything to add to that? The what? The saints. The saints, which might be the same thing as the church, right? We're going to talk about that in the next slide. Um, so I was doing a little bit of a research. The word rapture is actually found in your Bible how many times? Zero. Thank you. Zero. But the, it, it's, a, it's a joining of two Greek words, and one of them means the catching away, and the other one means rapid or quick, quick catching away, right? So immediately the two words went through my mind, which are rapid departure. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool, because you could take rap, rapid departure and make rapture, right? So this is, this is the rapture is the rapid departure, quick departure of the followers of Christ, the church, to meet the Lord in the air. And we're going to talk about what is the church so we don't have confusion there. Um, and then we're also going to talk about the tribulation. Now, when you think of the tribulation, what do you think of? What goes through your mind? Difficult times, yes. Following Christ. Following Christ. Ah, because in this world you will have trouble. Yeah, that's true. Tribulation. Somebody else? Now. <laughs> now. Yeah. So you think we're in it, brother? No, 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 no. no? all right. It's yeah, no. It's get, we're moving in that direction. We're, we're one day closer today than we were yesterday. That I know. What did I hear somebody back here? Persecution. Yeah, persecution, right? A time of tribulation. And we're going to look at many, many verses that talk about that. Because what we're really here to pin down tonight is the timing of the rapture. We know it's going to happen. Does the Bible tell us when it's going to happen? In my research for this, you know, I was reading different things and different people's, you know, opinions, and I, I, I opened one article, and it literally started with, the Bible does not tell us when the rapture will happen. If it did, it would settle the issue. And I thought, well, gosh, I can think of a bunch of scriptures that tell us when it's going to happen, so I don't know. But uh, we'll look at them together tonight, and hopefully uh, we'll come to the same conclusion. So, we also, the tribulation is literally the greatest time of anguish and difficulty the world has ever known. Uh, and, it's, and it's described that way. We're going to look at those passages, but uh, angels say that in the book of Daniel. This, uh, then a time of trouble worse than any time since nations came into existence will, will, uh, will happen. It's literally going to be an extinction level event. Now, you might think that's a little extreme, but Jesus said... If I don't shorten the days, nobody will survive. Now, is that not an extinction-level event? Right? So it's going to be tough. Things are going to get rough, right? But that's okay, because we don't ever die, do we, honey? That's frequent at our house. We frequent, frequent conversation. Um, now, what is the church? When you think of the word church, what do you think of? And again, we're just defining a few terms before we dive into all the passages on the timing of the rapture. But what do you think of when you hear the word church? People. Okay, people. Just every, anybody? No. What people? Who okay, people who follow Christ. Okay. Anybody think of anything else? The body of Christ. The body of Christ, which would be the collective, right? The people who follow Christ. Yep. Yeah. Okay. An assembly. Okay, an assembly, gathering. Uh-huh. Gathering of people who follow Christ. Good. Yeah. The bride of Christ. Excellent. Yeah. 
God's chosen. Excellent. Yeah? I use the word you taught me, ecclesia. Ah, yeah. The ecclesia, the, the uh, ecclesia, depending on uh, what, you know, how you want to pronounce it. But, yep. And that is the Greek word for the, the official gathering for an official purpose. So, like uh, Kelly said, official gathering. It's the word ecclesia. And... It is literally meant an official gathering for an official purpose. Sorry that's so small. That should be a little bit bigger. But when Jesus, when he used the word ecclesia, he said, I will build my church. He did not go build buildings, did he? We don't have any record of him doing that. And he was a carpenter. He could have. But he didn't. When he said that, everybody knew what he meant. That word was a common word in the, in the language, spoken language of the day. So if you gathered a group of people for any reason at all, that would be an ecclesia. So Jesus said, my ecclesia is going to attack and overpower the gates of hell, right? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. So Jesus' church is simply just a gathering of the followers of Jesus for Jesus' purposes. Sometimes I say it's Jesus' people doing Jesus' work in Jesus' power under Jesus' direction, right? It's all about Jesus. doesn't matter if it's in a holy hall or, you know, religious uh, building or not. If it's, if it's God's people gathering to do his work, then that's the church. That's the church that Jesus came to create. And so it has little to do with religion or holy huddles in holy halls. Um, other, what are other names for the church? A few of them got thrown out here. What, what um, somebody said, the bride of Christ. What else? comes to your mind. What about the body of Christ? Is that the church? Right? What about the, uh, the saints? When the Bible talks about the saints, is that the church? Okay. When the Bible talks about the holy ones of the Most High, is that the church? Okay. What about when it talks about the elect? Is that the church? Okay. So we're all in agreement that all of those are just synonyms for the same, the same group of people. The, the, the bride of Christ is the body of Christ, is the saints, is the holy ones of the Most High, is the elect, and that is the church. Okay? Holy nation of priests. Holy nation of priests. Excellent. Yeah, I didn't put them all down. These are just the ones that came to my mind as I was typing this up. Anybody have any others before we move on? We're going to talk about some of these because sometimes there's confusion. People will say, oh, well, the church is here and the elect are over here and the saints are over here and like as if they're not the same group of people but that's that's not the case so speaking of the rapture now what are the different views on the rapture what are the what are the views that you've heard when i if i asked you you know what are the different views out there on the rapture or the timing of the rapture what what would come to your mind Pre-tribulation, okay. Mid-trip. What? Mid-trip. Mid-trip, yeah. And post-trip. And pan. And what? Pan. Pan, okay, tell me about that one. It'll all pan out. It'll all pan out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good, that's good. I heard another one, too. Somebody, I, I, I ran into somebody who believes that we are now living in the, in the thousand-year reign of Christ. We're in the kingdom of God right now. And I thought, oh, my gosh, that sounds awful. I don't, right? <laughs> I read in my Bible, and it sounds a lot better in there than what we're experiencing right now. So you guys nailed them. The pre-tribulation rapture, which is, of course, that the believers or the church exits the world before the tribulation. Then we've got the mid-tribulation rapture, which is the believers exit halfway or somewhere around the middle of the tribulation. And then we have the post-tribulation rapture um, view that all believers exit at the end of the tribulation. We're not actually going to cover the mid-tribulation rapture too much tonight because I don't find very many people who believe it, and I can't find anything in my Bible that talks about it. So I'm kind of like, you know, let's step away from that one. We're going to look at the other two. We're going to look at the, the pre-trib, and we're going to look at the post-trib uh, views, and just, again, see what the Bible says, because it doesn't matter what Kurt thinks, what matters is what God thinks, right? So how many of you think we're living in the last days? Us, I, I know Moses does, he already, somebody, yeah, go, show me your hands nice and high, I want to see, most of you believe we're living in the last days, okay, and that's the response that I get pretty much everywhere I go now, if I ask that question, people say, yeah, usually 75% or so of the group says, yep, I think we're living in the last days, or we're moving into 
the last days. It's, you can see the writing on the wall, right? And um, so there is a verse in 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. Does anybody know that one off the top of their head? It says something like this. Paul is talking to Timothy, and Paul said, A time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who teach what their itching ears want to hear. Does anybody think we're living in those days right now? Right. Think about this. If you lived in, if you lived in uh, the feudal times or the dark ages in Europe, and you lived in a little feudal town, would, was that even possible? Could you gather to yourself teachers that you want to hear? If you don't, no. All you can do is go down to the local holy hall on Sunday and listen to whoever's installed there and whatever they have to say, whether you like it or not. You either go or you don't go. Those are your only options. And then television was invented, and then cable television was invented, and people started gaining the ability to gather to themselves teachers they like. Oh, I really like to listen to this guy, you know. I remember a time when, you know, you, the TV, the, it was just on when it was on, and you had to either be in front of the, the, the right? You, now you can just stream it anytime you want, pause it, go back, watch it later, whatever. But what did COVID do to advance this? Oh, man. oh my gosh, right? Everybody go home. Everybody, you can't meet in your big buildings anymore. Go in your house, and everybody's still, you guys are spiritual people, so you feel like, oh, gosh, I want to have spiritual input, but my, you know, my Sunday morning thing is, is gone away, so what, will I'm, what am I going to do? I'm going to go on to YouTube, and I'm going to find teachers that I like, right? And there's nothing wrong with that as long as those teachers are teaching the truth. But if they're not, you know, you need to know, and, and we need to know, and that's why, we're, that's why we're here to talk about it, because if we are living in the last days, this has to happen before Jesus comes back. And I think it's, you know, we're living in the middle of this right now. In fact, somebody told me the other day that the power grid's going to go down. And if it does, now what are we going to do? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, what in the world will we do? Yeah, you can't go on your internet. I mean, I read my Bible on my phone right now, if I'm honest with you. You know, I guess if I could still charge my phone, I could still. Anyway, if, if well, I, how am I going to charge my phone if there's no power? Solar. Huh. Solar. I, do I have one? I think I do have a little solar. You got me one? Oh, thank you. I know right where it is. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you just a quick example. This pertains to the rapture, so we're moving into the rapture, but it's also an example of people gathering teachers who teach what their itching ears want to hear. Right? So, how many of you have heard this verse, Revelation 3.10? It says, Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the time of testing that will come upon the whole world. How many of you have heard that verse before? Yes. Okay. How many of you think that says every Christian on earth gets to go to heaven and gets to skip the rapture? Anybody think that's what it says? No. Nope. Because... This is one letter written to one church out of seven, right? And it's, it's nice, though. It feels good. I like this. I want to I uh, be protected from the time of testing. It's going to come on the whole world. I don't want to go through anything difficult. But we, we pick this one, right? We, we gravitate toward this verse because it's, it, it feels nice. It feeds our flesh. But then the next... <laughs> the next letter written to the next church says this. Oh, wait a minute. Right down here? Yeah, this right here. You do not realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. How many of you want Jesus to say that to you? If you had to pick between the two, which one would you pick? One of them has to apply to me. Hmm. I think I'll, I think I'll go with the top one because the bottom one doesn't sound very nice. It's, it's not comfortable, right? That's what we do. And people use this verse, and they say, yeah, see, everybody gets to go to heaven before the rapture. And I, I, I mean, I just have to question that. Because what have I persevered for Jesus? Really? What have, what have you persevered for Jesus? If you 
If you were to tell me the church in the world that's persevered the most, would you say the church in America? What church would you say? China. China? Iran? Iran? North Korea. North Korea? Russia? Yeah. Saudi Arabia, Somalia, North Africa, just name. About half the world is experiencing some level of persecution and they have struggled and they have suffered. And here we are saying, oh, because I've persevered, I get to be protected from the time of testing. I don't think that holds water. And the other thing that I have realized is that the persecuted church around the world doesn't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture theology. They believe in a post-tribulation rapture theology. They believe that they're going to be raptured at the end. It's funny to me, right? So the church in the West that hasn't really experienced persecution, they are more, uh, more likely, they, they more likely believe in the pre-tribulation rapture uh, teaching. And the church that's been experiencing persecution their entire existence or for, you know, many, many years, like China and Iran and those churches, Somalia, they don't even believe it. It's interesting. Because I think because they're already living persecution, so they don't, they kind of feel like, well, wh that doesn't make sense to me. I'm living persecution every day, right? Okay, so regarding the timing of the rapture, God is not confused. Now, I mean, he knows exactly when it's going to happen. And I've had people say to me, well, wait a minute now, Kurt. Uh, Jesus said, no man will know the day or the hour, or woman. Right? Didn't Jesus say that? Yeah. What did he say right before that? Does anybody know? Only the Father. Well, the that's, the same, that's the same passage. Right before that, he said, when you see a tree begin to come out into leaf, a fig tree, you know that summer is near. And then he said, in the same way, when you see these things begin to take place, you know that it is near, right at the door. He's talking about his return. He's talking about, um, you know, the time of the, of the end. You know that this tribulation period is right there when you see all this stuff that he was talking about begin to happen. So we don't know the day or the hour, but we will know the season. And that's why even sitting here, you can say with confidence, you know, it does seem like things are getting darker. It does seem like we're moving into the, into the last days. And you know, the Bible isn't confused either. The Bible knows when the rapture is going to happen. And, and I think after you look at all the passages we look at tonight, that you will also agree the Bible is very clear, very specific on when it's going to happen. And so... The truth is that it's people who are confused. God's not confused. The Bible's not confused. People are confused about the biblical timing of the rapture. So how many times is rapture in the Bible? We already talked about that. Zero. So my great concern is this. In Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the last days. He's talking about the tribulation period. And he says, at that time, many will be offended and repelled by their association with me. This is the amplified version. And they will fall away from the one they should be trusting in. And they will betray one another, handing each other over to their persecutors, and they will hate one another. I was in Africa doing, uh, doing a conference on discipleship, and the man who invited me told the group, he just sort of matter-of-factly said, well, yeah, people are going to fall away because they're going to find themselves in a tribulation they're not prepared for. And I was like, oh, what if that's true? And it kind of got me, got me on this, you know, quest to dig and to learn and to search this out and really understand it uh, to a point where I feel like I can teach it uh, to you guys with confidence. In fact, that same man, the friend from Africa, sent me a you know, does anybody, you guys all get these on your phone, little, I don't know what you call them. It's like a picture with words on it. Is that a GIF or a meme? Okay, meme, right? So he sent me a meme. And he said, in the meme, it said, never be afraid to speak, or to offend people by speaking the truth. And then the next line said, always be afraid of the people who will be destroyed if you don't. And I was like, oh, I needed to hear that. Because sometimes speaking the truth is uncomfortable, especially if it's, you know, a difficult truth that people don't want to hear. 
So the other day, uh, our accountant came in. We have a, you know, we run a small ministry. We have a, a part-time accountant who does the books. Thank you, Jesus, because that's not our gift. Joni used to do our books for us. God bless you. Give Joni a hand. Thank you. you should, no, no, I know, but you put, up with, you put up with me and my inability to handle finances, so I appreciate that. Um, so, so the accountant shows up, and he knows that I'm getting prepared for this teaching, and he, and he comes into my uh, living room. We've got a little office off the living room. He comes in, and he says, hey, when I was driving over here today, he said, I was listening to a radio preacher, and if I named this man, you guys would know who I'm talking about. And he said, and that man said, the rapture happens in Revelation 4 because the church is not present in the book of Revelation after Revelation 3. And then he said, is that true? And uh, I could feel my blood pressure went up a little bit when he, I said, oh man, I said, that is a, um, I said, that is a false ignorant, misleading statement. And I'm sorry to say it that way, but that's the truth. It is misleading people, it's ignorant, and it's false. The truth is that the word church isn't found in Revelation after chapter 3. But you guys just told me that the church is the bride of Christ. The church is the believers. The church is the saints. The church is the elect, right? It's all the same group. It's just a different word that describes the same group of people. And so what we want to do is let's just look. Um, I've heard several people who, are, who, you know, who give their, give their uh, teaching on the, on the rapture, people who have PhD uh, behind their name, and I don't. And, uh, and they say it happens at Revelation 4, verse 1. Has that, any of you ever heard that? The rapture happens, Revelation 4, 1. No? Okay, you've heard it? All right. Yeah. Well, let's look at Revelation 4.1. You tell me if, if you see the rapture there, okay? So here's what Revelation 4.1 says. Jesus said to John, come up here, and I'll show you what may, must take place after this. And they say that that come up here, because that's a Greek word. Um, anybody know the Greek word? Got any? Harpazo, have you heard that before? So the Greek word for the being caught up or being uh, uh, taken away is harpazo. And it's used in the Bible. It's, it's not, um, you know, it's obviously it's used here because John is caught up to heaven. Who else was caught up? Paul was caught up. He was harpazoed, right? What about Jesus? Enoch. Yep, Enoch was. It's a different word because that's the Old Testament, so it's uh, Hebrew, but correct. Enoch was. Who else was caught up to heaven without dying? Elijah, yeah. Moses. Didn't Moses die? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Because even Paul said, whether I, I was, I'm not sure if I was in the body or out of the body, but I went to heaven and saw amazing things, right? Jesus was harpazo. Jesus was ascended into heaven. Amen. Yeah. How about Philip? Philip was in the water with the Ethiopian eunuch, and then what happened? That's the same word, harpazo. He was harpazoed, but he was deposited back on earth in a different spot. Paul was harpazoed, went to heaven, saw things, and was deposited back on earth. John went to heaven, saw things, right? That's where we get the book of Revelation from. It was what was revealed to him while he was in heaven. And then he was deposited back on the earth, right? So... The pre-tribulation position wants you and me to believe that because the word church doesn't appear after this, that the church must have gone to heaven with John. Does that make sense to anybody? No, because John came back, and that happened 2,000 years ago. It was an actual real event. Went to heaven, saw some stuff, wrote it down, came back. So to say that the people of God who are still here on the earth today got raptured 2,000 years ago, but yet we're here, it doesn't make sense, right? No? But that's, that's what the position, and again, I'm just telling you what the positions are. I want you to draw your own conclusions based on actually looking at the, looking at the passages. So we're going to see where the church is in Revelation, but before we do that, what would you say? How many of you have read the book of Revelation? 
How many of you have read it more than five times? Wow. How many of you have read it more than 10 times? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, since, since 2020, um, the Lord had me in it a bunch. I read it probably 20 times since COVID started. Um, but yeah, praise the Lord. And you, every time you read it, you see something new, don't you? It's not like, it's not like oh, I read that, I'm good. I, it's, it, God keeps showing you stuff. So I think, if somebody were to ask me on the street, if I walked outside here, somebody said, what, what's the theme of Revelation? I think I would say, I think the theme of Revelation is the persecution of the church during the tribulation. I think that's the theme of the book. You guys who've read it a bunch of times, would you agree with that? Not sure? Well, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at a bunch of, tell me when we're done if you're, if you're sure. So, as I said, the uh, pre-trib teachers or the pre-trib position is that the rapture takes place right here. The rapture of you and me. That that I don't know how it works. 2,000 years ago it happened, but we're here. But it's going to happen again in the future. So, um, so let's just look for ourselves, okay? And I, I'm just going to go through Revelation, and I'm just going to quickly bounce through the verses uh, that seem to show us that the body of Christ is still there. The church is still there. So this is the first one I want to start with. Now, this is... Revelation 6. How many of you know Revelation has four, at least four sevens in it? There's the seven letters to the seven churches. Do you know of more than four? Yeah. So there's the four letters to the, to the seven churches. That's in chapters 2 and 3. And then chapter uh, 6 and 7, there's what we call the seven seals. You've heard of the seven seals, right? The first four are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. People, you know, get the, the riders of the apocalypse, whatever. Um, this is seal number five. And at seal number five, I want you to see what's going on here. This is a scene in heaven. And these people are martyrs. They have been killed for the cause of Christ, and they're under the throne. And they're saying, they're crying out to God, saying, How long until you avenge our blood? And then what does God say to them? First of all, what was given to them? A white robe. Yep. So keep that in the back of your mind. The martyrs were given a white robe. All right. And then it says they were told to rest a little while longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus who were to be martyred, had joined them. What more do you need? Right? Where can you be martyred from? <laughs> All people are in one of three places. They're either in heaven, they're in hell, or they're on the earth, right? So can you be martyred from heaven? Can you be martyred from hell? There is nobody there that's a potential martyr, right? <laughs> so the only place you can be martyred from is from the earth. So this is literally saying, hey, um, you guys just wait a little while because... There's a bunch more martyrs that have to come in still. Mm. Mm. Now, I don't know if the, the seven seals are part of the tribulation or not. They might be the beginning. They might be part of the last days, but leading up to the tribulation. Does that make sense? So after the seals come seven trumpets, and then after the trumpets come seven bowls. And the, tr the trumpets are for sure during the tribulation. The bowls are for sure during the tribulation. Not so sure about the seals. That might just be the, the ugliness leading up, to the, uh, leading up to the tribulation. But the point is, this is after Revelation 4, and there's still people on the earth that need to be martyred. So rapture hasn't happened yet, right? Right? Everybody agree? Okay. Now check this out. Revelation 7, verse 3 and 4. In verse 3, some angels are going to leave heaven and they're going to go down and they're going to do some harm on the earth. And then they're told, wait, don't, don't go harm the earth yet because we have to do something. Look what it says there. What do they have to do? We got to put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of God well, where are those servants of God? 
Are they in heaven? No. Are they in hell? No. So there's only three choices. You're in heaven or you're in hell or you're on the earth. So they're on the earth, right? And then John says, I heard how many were marked from the tribes of Israel. It was 144,000. And then it goes through and lists 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, which I'll spare you those details. You can read it for yourself. Revelation 3. So again, just keep noticing, right? We're, we're after chapter 4, and there's still believers on the earth. How about this one? John says, I saw a vast crowd too great to count from, check this out, I love this, every nation, tribe, people, and language standing in front of the throne of the Lamb. So he's seeing a scene in heaven, and there's a crowd of people that's so big, nobody can count it from all the people groups of the earth. So this vision, even though it's in the middle of the seals, this is probably at the end of the tribulation period because People are there from every tribe, people, language, you know, standing in front of the throne. That job isn't done yet. There's still people on the earth today who have not heard about Jesus, as I mentioned before. So there's no way this, this could, you know, this is still future from where we are in, in time. Does that make sense? Because people from every language and every tribe have not yet even heard about Jesus. And that's what our ministry exists to, to try to alleviate. But look what they were given. Huh, who's the last group who had white robes? Ah, oh, the martyrs. You think maybe? Possibly? These people, at least some of them, martyred? Could be. Doesn't say for sure, but we know that there's this huge crowd. I mean, how big, how big of a crowd can you count? I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm, right? We see the feeding of the 5,000. Somebody counted those people, and I think, oh, I'm glad that wasn't me. Um, but... They were shouting with great joy. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. They're fired up. They're excited to be there. They're there in heaven finally. And then one of the 24 elders asked me, who are these people clothed in white? Where do they come from? It's kind of a rhetorical question because he knows. John doesn't even know. John says, sir, you're the one who knows. And then look at this. Look at this. These are the ones who died in the great tribulation. Huh. Well, if they died in the Great Tribulation, were they raptured before the Great Tribulation? No. no. So, now, and again, what you're gonna, if you go tell anybody who's a pre-trib person, the, you show them these verses, every single time, they're going to say, that's not the church. They're going to say, the church has already been raptured, that's the elect, or that's the, you know, that's some other group of people. It's the... Uh, what do they call them? The tribulation saints. Have any of you ever heard that phrase? The tribulation saints? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And the, the, the thinking there is that we are all going to get snatched out any minute. And then all the baby believers who have not yet surrendered their lives to Christ are going to realize, oh my gosh, I missed the rapture. And then they're going to get saved. And then... If you, if you follow that to its logical conclusion, then those would have to be the people who finish the Great Commission. Those would have to be the people who stand up to the Antichrist. Baby believers, stand up to the Antichrist, don't take the mark, don't worship the beast, don't worship his image. But all of us who never had to resist any of that pressure, we get to, we get to go home and, and never have to deal with it. That's what, the, you know, that's, that's what you would be told. So, the next verse, again, just want to go through Revelation kind of quickly, but I want you to keep track. How many have we seen so far in Revelation? How many times have we seen the church present after Revelation 4? Yeah, four? Four times. I think you're right, Wendy, four times. So, this, is, this would be number five. It says... An angel with a gold incense burner came and stood before the altar, and a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but you don't pray to God from heaven. People in heaven don't pray to God. They just talk to God. It doesn't ever say you pray. People who are in heaven, they have a conversation with an angel. They have a conversation with that elder. It says the elder said to John, right? They're having conversations. Prayer takes place from here, from the earth. 
My guess is there's probably a lot of prayer taking place from hell. But nobody in heaven has to pray to God. They can just talk to him. So this is at least a potential that the prayers of God's people are still going up during this, this time when a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the, um, with the incense or with the prayers of God's people. Now, how many of you guys have heard about, well, have you watched movies about the last days? Anybody watch like movies about, you know, the, the yeah. So there's a, there's a pretty popular character in Revelation. It's these, I don't know how big they are. It's these locusts that come out of a, come out of a, a smoke, uh, looks like a smoke from a furnace, maybe something that looks like a volcano to us, right? And the locusts come out of that thing, and, and they're told something. Bef as they're coming out of that furnace, they're, they're going to go out and they're going to harm people on the earth. And look at what they're told. Don't harm the grass or the plants or the trees. Only harm the people who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. So what does that indicate to you? That there's still people with the seal here, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be phrased that way. It would say, don't harm the plants, but harm the people. But it doesn't say that. It says, don't harm the plants, don't harm the people with the seal, in a sense. Only harm those who don't have God's seal on their foreheads, God's seal, God's protection on them. So again, you've still got the sealed people here. And this is definitely during... The, tri the, the, the tribulation period. Now we're getting into the time of the trumpets. And, and things are starting to get real. You know, things are starting to get uh, really difficult. And check this out. So jumping ahead uh, to Revelation chapter 12, it says, they have defeated him. Him is the Antichrist. So how do you defeat him if you're not here? Well... You know, like I said, some people will say, well, that's the, you know, those are the tribulation saints. So, you know, just for fun yesterday, I opened up uh, a Bible app and I typed in, because I like to do that, you know, how many times does this word appear in the Bible? How many times does this word appear in the Bible? And I put in the phrase tribulation saints. Do you know how many times that appears in the Bible? Zero. Zero. Yeah, it's just not there. So it's interesting, right, that because if God makes a big deal about it, we should make a big deal about it. If God doesn't address it, then it's probably not something we need to make a big deal about. But these people de defeated the Antichrist by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. And notice this, too. They didn't love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Now, that might sound a little harsh, a little difficult. Oh, my gosh, I don't, you know, I don't want to die. I don't know about you. I don't. I don't want to die. But even Jesus in his teaching, he said that you should take up your cross daily and follow me. And that's the same thing. It means don't love your life so much that you're afraid to die. Your cross is an instrument of execution. Live your life like you're on your way to your execution anyway. That's part of Jesus' teaching. And so this is just reiterating that same uh, thinking, that same mindset in a different way. Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was angry. Who's the dragon? Satan. Satan. And uh, does anybody know who the woman is in Revelation? Israel, thank you. The woman in Revelation is Israel. Now, the reason the dragon is angry, and we're going to see this later because we're going to look in the book of Daniel, but the reason the dragon's angry is because he can't get at the woman. He wants to attack her, and she's being protected She's being miraculously protected, possibly by an angel whose name you know. We're going to look at that. But what, what, what did he decide to do then? Well, I can't get the woman. I can't get Israel, so I'm going to take off and do something else. What, did, what, did, what does it say he's, he went to do? Make war. Make war against who? Yep, her children. And who are her children? Thank you. The church, all who keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony for Jesus. So there it is again. The people of God who maintain their testimony and, and keep Jesus' commandments, keep God's commandments. The, the devil's like, okay, I want to attack Israel, specifically the Israeli people who are God's people, 
Because just because you're Jewish doesn't mean you're a follower of Jesus Christ, right? So these people are being protected, and the devil can't get at them. So he says, okay, I'm going to go after the rest of her offspring, the rest of the children of Israel, which in a sense are the church because we are the, the followers of Jesus, and Jesus was Jewish, and he was a child, an offspring of the nation of Israel, right? So Revelation 13, the beast, again, this is the Antichrist. So we're in the middle of the tribulation period. He was allowed to wage war. We just saw that, right? He went off to wage war against who? God's holy people. Is that the church again? Yes. Yeah, again, again, again. And verse 10, anyone who's destined for prison will be taken to prison. Anyone destined to die by the sword will die by the sword. This means what? Yeah, who, who, who is supposed to uh, endure persecution patiently and remain faithful? Right? The church, God's holy people, it's the same group of people. How many of you think that God's going to take all the spiritual parents out of the world and leave only spiritual babies to, to have to endure this? Does that sound like the way God operates? No, not at all. So, and, and something that blows my mind a little bit is right here. It says, he was given authority to rule every tribe, people, language, and nation. Well, who else was given all that authority? Hmm? The beast. Well, the beast was given it here, but who was given it right after he rose from the dead? There's a clue. Jesus. Jesus was given all authority in heaven and on earth, and he says that. He says, gives the Great Commission. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Right? So he has it. And here... He's willingly giving it to the devil, to the Antichrist, to the beast, for a short time. The devil's going to get his 15 minutes of fame, and then he's going to get his spanking. And so we're uh, not looking forward to the 15 minutes of fame, but we are looking forward to the spanking. Yeah, right? Praise the Lord. So, and we're going to look at that. Again, we're just looking at what the Bible says about all this stuff. So here, there's two different times. You see God's holy people there, God's holy people there. Church is still there. How about this one? He, this is the Antichrist, was permitted to give life to his statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded, anyone refusing to worship it must die. Do you think there's any followers of Jesus? Do you think there's any members of the church that are going to refuse to uh, worship the beast? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because who's he primarily waging war against? The church, right? The holy ones of God. There might be some people from other religions who are super devout who also are willing to die for their faith, but primarily the, the Antichrist is going after the people of God because they're the ones who refuse to worship him. You know, this is, this is the same playbook over again from the book of Daniel. Do you remember in the book of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar uh, built this big gold statue, 90 feet tall, well, let me ask you something. If, if Nebuchadnezzar had the technology to make that thing talk, do you think that he would have made it talk? Yeah. yeah. So now here we see the beast, the Antichrist, this person's going to rise up to world prominence, and uh, he's going to make a statue of himself, and he's going to demand that everybody worship it, and it can speak. Modern technology, AI, right? So if the Antichrist is on the toilet, and it's time to worship him, you just worship the... So worship the statue. Same playbook that we saw under Nebuchadnezzar thousands of years ago. And anybody who won't worship it, they have to die. It's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did in Daniel. Well, then you got to go into the fiery furnace. And this means, the fact that we're supposed to, you know, not, let me rephrase that. The Antichrist is going to require demand that people worship him, worship his image, and then there's something about a mark. Um, take a mark on their, where's the mark go? Right hand, right hand or? Right hand. Or your forehead. And you know, thankfully, you and I, our forehead's already busy, right? 
We've already been sealed in the forehead. We can't put it there, and we're certainly not going to let them put it on our right hand. So it says, this means that God's holy people must endure persecution patiently, obeying his commands, maintaining their faith in Jesus. Is that the church still present on the, on the earth in Revelation? Yeah. See? I mean, like I said, to me, it seems like that's the theme of the book. That's what the whole book's about. Revelation 14, 13. I heard a voice in heaven saying, write this down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. How many of you want to be blessed by God? How many of you want to still be in the Lord when you die? Yeah. See, the, the motivation for doing this is we don't want any of you or anybody who, who views this teaching in the future to be one of the people who falls away during the tribulation. That's literally what Jesus is talking about. At that time, many will fall away, betray, and hate each other. So, but people will die in the Lord, and that's okay, because we all got to die of something. Might as well be in the Lord when we do it, right? Revelation 15, 2. I saw before me what seemed to be a glass sea mixed with fire, and on it stood... Who stood on that glass sea? Sorry that I'm in your way, you guys. Who stood on the glass sea? Sure. The people who had been? Victorious. Yeah, victorious over the beast. And his statue, and the? The number, the mark, right? The 666. The number representing his name. So here you have a, a, a scene in heaven of people who were victorious over the beast, but where are they? Where are they in this passage? They're still on earth? They're standing on a sea of glass mixed with fire? Holding on to harps? They're in heaven now. But how'd they get to heaven? You have to, right? I mean, if, <laughs> if, the, if the tribulation is still going on, your only way to get to heaven is, is to die, mm -hmm. right? If the, if the rapture didn't take you there, you only have one other option. You've got to die to get to heaven. And these people were victorious over the beast. That means they encountered him. They faced him, and they won. They were victorious. These people literally encountered the Antichrist and they didn't break, they didn't, they didn't worship him, they didn't worship the, uh, the image, they didn't take the mark, they said no, no. And then they were dispatched to heaven. It says they defeated them by the word of their testimony. Mm -hmm. By the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. They afraid to die. And they, yeah, exactly, they weren't afraid to die. They would rather die and go to heaven than live a few more miserable months or years in this world under the rule of the Antichrist. And wouldn't all of you want that same thing? Yes. Amen. Yeah. So in Revelation 16, 15, Jesus said, look, I'm going to come as unexpectedly as a thief. You've all heard that, right? Isn't there a thief in the night? Um, there's a movie series. Carrie and I worked at the church where they filmed part of that uh, in Des Moines, Iowa, Thief in the Night. Um, but he says, blessed are you if you're watching for me. Well, wait a minute. Now, I mean, right? If he, He's up there. He's going to come here. And he says, I'm going to come as unexpectedly as a thief. So be watching for me. Wh where are you? Yeah, you're on the earth when you're watching for him. So again, here you have the body of Christ on the earth. Now listen, if, if somebody would have told me that thing about the you know, this isn't the church. The church has been already taken out, and these are the tribulation saints. You know, if it was once or twice, I might buy that. But I mean, come on, right? It's over and over and over again. Anybody keeping count? No, I counted them all. I'll tell you. Wendy, are you keeping count? Look at that. You're a good student. Well, Not that the rest of you aren't. I don't mean that. <laughs> um, okay, so here, Revelation 17, 16. I could see that she was drunk. Okay, so there's a section in Revelation, Revelation 17 and 18, that talks about some entity that is called the great harlot, the great prostitute, uh, mystery Babylon. There might be other names that I'm not uh, thinking of right now. But in this passage, it's talking about mystery Babylon. And I have not been able to place the timing 
of Mystery Babylon, whether it's in or out of the tribulation. But when we see what's going on in Mystery Babylon, we definitely know it's part of the last days, part of the difficult days, right? Because look at this verse. Mystery Babylon, that's the she or the great harlot. She was drunk. What was she drunk with? The blood of the saints. Well, do you think that means maybe some of the blood of the saints was shed in her, under her jurisdiction, in her uh, realm, right? Whether, whether Mystery Babylon is a city or a empire? Because I don't know if you've, if, ever, if you've ever thought about this, if you've tried to identify who this is, but Babylon in the, in the Bible, the Babylon, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, that was both a city and an empire. Right? Bab uh, king Nebuchadnezzar ruled the city of, of Babylon, but his kingdom was called the kingdom of Babylon. And his people were the Babylonians, and the, you know, they're going all over the world conquering. And so there's some entity that resembles that. And we haven't been told. That's why it's a mystery. Who is this? But whoever it is, whatever it is, it might be a city and a kingdom or and a empire. Does that make sense? And we know that whoever it is hates the people of God because it's, it's killing God's holy people. So that's for sure persecution, for sure tribulation for us. It's for sure during a time of difficulty in the world. We just don't know if it's in or out of that seven-year you know, tribulation um, period. So also from Revelation 18, it says, I heard a voice calling from heaven, come away from her the great harlot, Mystery Babylon, my people. So, where are his people? They're on earth, and specifically they're in Mystery Babylon. He says, come away from her, come out from her, so that you won't take part in her sins or be punished with her, because God decrees punishment on Mystery Babylon, and we don't want to be part of that. In Revelation 18.20, it says, Rejoice over her fate. So once you determine who Mystery Babylon is, and then you see God punish her, it says rejoice over her fate. And who does it say are, is supposed to rejoice over her fate? The people that are in there. Yeah, the people of God and the apostles and the prophets. Yeah, and maybe other people around the world, right? Imagine that. This is one country, and you live in a neighboring country, but you've seen your friends and your loved ones and your um, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ be, be martyred and persecuted and, and killed there, and then you see God's judgment fall on, on her. That wouldn't be too hard to take, would it? You'd be like, oh, thank you, Lord, for finally avenging the death of all these people. So... Obviously, again, there are people of God on the earth watching this happen, watching the judgment of God poured out on Mystery Babylon. You know, there's only 22 chapters in Revelation, so we're getting close to the end of the passages in Revelation. Wendy, how many do you have so far? Did you, did you count them up? Uh, you got 12 so far? Okay. So here we see, again, Mystery Babylon has been destroyed, and who is supposed to rejoice? Oh, wait a minute. I just did that. Sorry. This one. In your streets, Mystery Babylon, flowed what? The blood of who? God's holy people. The blood of the people slaughtered all over the world, right? Prophets. So, so whoever this is, in the last days, this entity is going to go hog wild trying to kill all of God's people, especially anybody who has the... Uh, prophetic, those people tend to be a little more out there. You know, they're, they're, they're easier to see, easier to target because they're, they're prophesying their messages. But then it even says of people slaughtered all over the world. So this, this is a, a wicked entity that goes after God's people in its own location and all over the world. But again, they're on the world being slaughtered because they're still here during this time. Right? Revelation 19. God's punishments are true and just. He punishes the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality, and he avenged what? 
He avenged the murder of his saints. And his saints are, is that, or his servants. Is that just another word to say the church again? Right? So again, 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 again. It seems redundant, you know, like I'm just like, okay, Kurt, could you, you know, stop? But we're almost to the end of Revelation. I want to show you every single time so that there's no confusion. Is the church present after, you know, Revelation 4? And uh, I think you'll come to say, to agree, yes. Now, how many of you like the idea of ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years? Does that sound kind of nice? Yeah. And uh, you know, right, that what happens, what comes after this age, we're currently living in what some people call the church age, and this age is going to draw to a close, you know, in the last days, right? It's going to wind down. I kind of picture it like one of those penny things at, like, Walmart. You know what I'm talking about? You drop the penny in there, and it starts going like this, and then it gets to where it gets in the bottom. It's just going, and you're thinking, it's defying gravity. It's like laying sideways in there. Well, it speeds up at the end. It feels that way with world events, doesn't it? Like we're getting into the, the tight end of the funnel. And so how many of you are willing, to, are willing to do whatever it takes to end up ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years? Yeah? Why not? Okay, well, let's see what the Bible says about who gets to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. <laughs> you know, well, there's no, there's no, there's no, uh, you, can't, you can't candy coat that one, can you? Right? So who gets to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years? Come on, who's willing to say it? The church. What does this specifically say about these particular people? Thank you very much. I know. I know. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus. Remember the verse we saw a little bit ago where it said, um, if you're destined to go to the sword, you'll go to the sword. That's how that happens a lot of the time. Not always. Um, they, but look at how they got there. They didn't worship the beast or its image, and they did not receive the mark on their forehead or on their hand. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, that is not to say that if you don't get beheaded, you don't get to reign with Christ a thousand years, okay? Don't hear me saying that. This verse might lead you to think that, but when you, when you look at all of the verses together, you will not come to that conclusion. Um, so we have been uh, at this now for about an hour. Anybody feel like a, a break? Use the bathroom, grab a cup of coffee, something like that. Yeah, yeah.